Okay, let me share the screen. Um, I can't share the screen. There we go. Okay, everyone can see can see the screen. Someone? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Welcome back. Nice to see you all again. This is our last class in this course. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna read the last part, learn the last part, then we'll do a little summary, and then we're gonna go back to the introduction. We'll finish with the introduction of this introductory course and uh, and try to see how everything fits in. Okay. So previously. I'll just do a quick refresher. We were talking about how after the Talmud was sealed in Babel, right? There was still a period that extended later on called the Geonic period, right? And during that time, uh, so they were the, the heads of the yeshivot, the heads of the court after the sealing of the Talmud. Right, and well, they didn't have the authorities of the Talmud of the decisions in the Talmud. However, they had the tradition of the Talmud, and so their answers, their responses, their commentaries, their interpretation of the Talmud is generally considered to be the most authority. And these Gaonim, they would receive uh, questions from all the different communities around the Jewish world as much as, as possible, right? However, this institute that started already many, many years earlier, which the product of that institute was the publication of the Talmud, this is the Kalah months, where all the Hachamim would gather from all around the Jewish world uh, for two months throughout the year, every six months, right? That continued on. However, because of all the wars that were going on in the world and the persecutions that were going on, and talking about the wars between, we're talking about now between the Persians and the Greek, and then between uh, the Romans and the Arabs, and then between the Christians and the Arabs, right? So people couldn't gather anymore like they used to in Bavel. And so even though the Kala continued, it didn't reflect the opinions of all of the Hachamim anymore because all of the Hachamim couldn't be present anymore. Let me just close this. And slowly, slowly, the center in Bavel was uh, dwindling. Its influence was diminishing. And the funding also was going uh, down slowly, slowly. Up until then, we, that was the center of uh, the political leadership of the Jewish people, headed by the Rosh Galut, or Resh Galuta, or Rosh Galut, the head of the diaspora, who was usually uh, almost always descended of King David, and also by the yeshiva, which was the representative of, we'll call it the judicial uh, authority. Uh, but as the center in Bavel, in Babylon, was diminishing, uh, a center in Spain was rising to the point where now we have, you don't have a Rosh Galut in Spain, we have a Nagit, right? A Nagit is kind of synonymous in his political power, in his influence over the political, uh, over the Jewish people. Um, and we have the yeshiva in Cordoba, who on one hand is, is, is a powerful yeshiva, but then what happens is there's a story of this, these four hachamim who are coming from Babel, right? And they're on a ship, and their intention is to go around uh, the Mediterranean area and, and collect funds uh, to fund the Kala Institute. Uh, however, their ship gets uh, overrun by, the, by pirates. It gets conquered by pirates. 
the pirates take them, these pirates come from Spain, these pirates take them captive and sell them off to the Jewish communities around the Middle East, right? One in, uh, around the, the, the Mediterranean, one in, in uh, was sold in Egypt, another one in Tunis, another one was sold in uh, Spain, and uh, the fourth one, we don't know. We don't know his whereabouts and what happened to him. So the one that was sold in Spain, or each one became, you know, they were uh, purchased by the Jewish community, and they each eventually became leaders of the community uh, that, uh, that freed them. And the one in Spain became the head of the yeshiva in Cordoba. And the one that was sold in Tunis, uh, he eventually raised the next generation of yeshiva in Cordoba. Right? He raised uh, Rabbeinu Hananel, whose student was Rabbi Ishaq al-Fasi. And Rabbi Ishaq al-Fasi eventually became the head of the yeshiva in Cordoba, the next generation of. And his student was Rabbi Yosef Alevi ibn Megas, and his student was Rabbi Maimon Haddayan, and his student was uh, uh, Rabbi Moshe ibn Maimon, also known as Maimonides. All right, so as the center in Babel is weakening, the center in uh, both politically and we'll call it uh, uh, legally uh, or spiritually, the center in Spain, in Cordoba, is strengthening both politically and also as the capital of the Jewish people, both politically and uh, spiritually slash uh, uh, legally, right? And this is the environment that the Rambam uh, grows up in. And and now we reach uh, Maimonides himself, who we've been studying. He was one of the main sources we've been studying throughout this entire course. All right. And he said, and he wrote the Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah is a collection of all of the laws uh, from the Talmud. And here he explains what exactly is this Mishneh Torah. All right. Right, he's talking about the Geonim. Says all the Geonim, all these post-Talmudic rabbis, uh, they wrote different books uh, or different uh, responses uh, on making Pesach Halakha. What is the law? Right, people come with some sort of dispute uh, to the court, and the court issues its verdict, and they publish these verdicts. Right, some of them were published in Arabic, and some of them were published in Hebrew. Right, such as, and he names a few of these books, Halachot Gidolot, Halachot Kituot. Right, there's of Rabbi Aham Mishabeha, and there's of Rabbi Shemu Kiara. All of these Hachamim have different, uh, all of these books come from the times of the Geonim. And then we reach uh, the beast Haq al-Fasi, right? He, was, he is now the head of the yeshiva in Cordoba, Spain. Right, however, now we reach the beast Haq al-Fasi, we we'll call it the teacher of the teacher of Maimonides, and he put together basically what he did is he took all of the Talmud and he kind of wrote. Uh, he went according to uh, the order of the Talmud and quoted uh, just the conclusions of the Talmud, and sometimes he'd include a little bit of the discussion, but then he'd write the conclusion. And anything that was a gada or midrash, he excluded from his work. It was basically what are the halachic conclusions of the Talmud, and he did this for pretty much almost the entire Talmud. And so, therefore, this work of uh, Rabbi Ishaq al-Fasi, a kind of uh, 
it, it, it's now it's it's more accessible to everybody. It's more understandable to everybody. Uh, you anyone who has a question in halacha, if it's in Shabbat, they'll go to they'll open a masechet Shabbat, and they have halachot of Rav Yishak al Fasi at the end, right? Yilchot Harif. Uh, that's what it's called in short. Yilchot Harif. They'll go and they'll see what. Besides all the discussion, what's the conclusion? He says, because this work of Rav Yishak al-Fasi includes all of the halachot that we need uh, that are relevant to our times. Our times being the times of the exile, right? The 2,000 year exile. Ukvar birer bahem kol ashigiyot, right? And he also checked uh, the different, uh, well, the different uh, editions of the Talmud that there may have been. He, he's maybe there was one gaon who made a pesach halacha one way, and another one that made pesach halacha a different way. And this Rabbi is hakal fasi the Reef. He already, uh, he, he already made a decision which one we should follow. Right, he was able to prove it uh, through the reasoning of the Talmud. So maybe some of the previous hachamim of the Gionim may have had an erroneous uh, mistake in Pesach Halacha. Says Rabbi Hakal Fasi, he already corrected all of them. Right, and we have very very little challenges to. Uh, the decisions of the Bees Hakafasi out of the thousands of alakhot that there are, maybe there are maybe like 30 alakhot that we still have questions about. He says that they don't even come up to 10, right? The truth is, there's about 30 differences between uh, uh, the Rambam, right, and, uh, and uh, the Bees Hakafasi. However, the Rambam writes this before he publishes his book uh, on Halachot. This is in his introduction to the Mishnah. Right? However, all these Halachot that we have from all the Gionim, right? Um, there's differences sometimes between them. Uh, these differences are because some of them are wiser than others. However, somebody who is fluent in the ways of the Talmud, somebody who studies the Talmud and then studies the responses of the Geonim, uh, he'll be able to understand, you know, uh, the personalities of the Gaon and, and his depth of understanding of each Gaon uh, based on his writings and how he interprets the Talmud. And right? And we did as the previous uh, generations as have done, right? That we uh, made a special effort to uh, investigate every single halakha to see how the words of the Geonim uh, match what's written in the Talmud. How did they interpret the discussion in the Talmud? How did they reach their conclusions? Right? And so we did the same thing in order to reach our conclusions on if there's a difference in opinion between the different Geonim to decide uh, which uh, decision or uh, which goal are we going to follow. Because remember, the ultimate authority on halakha at this point is what does the Talmud say? Not who came first and who has uh, greater stories of, uh, of their uh, uh, better stories of how great they are and, and uh, all sorts of uh, mysterious things that they're able to do. But who can better explain the decisions in the Talmud? 
The ultimate authority, halachic authority, is the Talmud from this point on. And so we are going to investigate um, the opinions of each of the Gionim in accordance to uh, whatever section of the Talmud they're trying to explain. And whichever fits in better will follow that opinion, even if he's not a Gaon, even if it's just a simple person. It's not likely, but even if it's just a simple person who has a better understanding of uh, this specific uh, section of the Talmud, because in the end, what matters is not who said whatever it was he said, but what did the Talmud say? As opposed to previously, when you had a Supreme Court, what mattered was what was the decision of the Supreme Court? Did the person who's relaying this decision have uh, have the semicha of the Supreme Court? Back then, it, it, it really mattered who, who said what. At this point, it doesn't matter who said it. What matters is it fits in with what the Talmud said. Okay? Right? And I collected all of the notes of my father. Right? His father was a great Dayan in Cordoba. He was a great, he, he, he was a top, uh, he was a top uh, judge in that court of Cordoba. Vizulati and also of others, Beshem Rabbenu Yosef Halevi Ibn Megas. Right, and also of the notes of Rabbi Yosef Halevi ibn Megas, who was the supreme, he was the head of that yeshiva in Cordoba. The, and he was the, study, the student of Rabbi Ishaq al Fasi, right? Who we said before already made one of the greatest works on halakha up until then. And so a student, Rabbi Yosef Halevi, who was uh, who, who, came, who was Rosh Hashiva after the Beis Hakal Fasi, right? He also had his notes on the sugio and on the different uh, uh, works of the Geonim. The Hayashin, right? And this is he's making the shiv was. It's, it's like I swear on my life, or I swear on the life of God. That this man's understanding of the Talmud is phenomenal. It's it's unbelievable how deep he can go into a sugya and explain it. Anybody who studies the words of Rabbi Yosef HaNevi Ibn Megas can really see how there was there's nobody like him in his understanding of the Talmud, right? And this is a student. Uh, previously, we said about him that he also says that right? That uh, his his character at, uh, is a testament that he is uh, from this uh, he is from the descendants of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Of Moses, right? That uh, he is uh, he is also very humble, right? So he had he had a great character. Uh, he is a very humble person, very very wise, and he has uh, up until then he has the the deepest understanding of the Talmud. So, uh, and this is the teacher of the Rambam, of Rabbi Moshe Bar Maimon. Uh, besides that. Right, I'm taking a passage now, not from the introduction, which we have been studying up until now, but much, much later, he's discussing a very specific halakha. We're not going to get into the specifics of the halakha because it's a bit complicated. I don't, to be honest, I don't fully understand it myself. But, um, you know, the Rambam, he grew up in Spain. And at some point, he had to flee Spain. Him and his family, they fled Spain, right? Uh, basically, uh, his days equivalent of ISIS took over Spain. They came from Morocco. They're called the al Muhadim. They came and they took over. They came from Morocco, North Africa, and took over Spain. 
and they had zero tolerance to any uh, non-Muslims, and they had a very, very strict uh, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic religion that they made everybody follow, and uh, the Maimonidean family, they weren't safe anymore, and they fled. They fled to North Africa, they actually went to Morocco, eventually they fled Morocco, came to Eretz Israel, they were here for a short while, and eventually established themselves in uh, uh, Fostat, which is an outskirts city of, of uh, Cairo in Egypt. All right? And so he went through all of these uh, journeys. And when he reached Egypt, he had access to one of the greatest Jewish libraries of all times. It's called the Cahirian Geniza, the archives in Cahir. And those archives in Cahir, in, in, in Cairo, first of all, they, they date very, very uh, 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 far back. Uh, letters, contracts, everything that passed through the Jewish communities, there was a copy of it in the archives in Cairo. It says, right? And over there, he came across some of the oldest versions and editions of the Talmud. Right? Right? There's a discussion between some of the Geonim. Some of the Geonim say that a person that comes to testify on a certain ma matter, uh, his testimony is, uh, um, say, it is, is qualified, you can accept it. And some of the Gionim said, no, this type of person, uh, his testimony is unacceptable. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't believe him, right? So he says, I, and I already went through all of the different versions, the old versions of the Talmud, because he had access to them in this archive. And when I was in Egypt, right, I managed to find some of these old Talmud, versions of the Talmud, that's written on the back of the parchment. It's a type of parchment. He says, he says and this is how they used to write the Talmud, 500 years ago. This is how he knows how old this version of the Talmud is. This is one of the original versions of editions of the Talmud. Right? And on this, uh, uh, and on these uh, editions of the Talmud, I found a few of them. And the way it was uh, written down in the, this halakha, in these Talmuds, right, is that he is Naaman, is that we do accept the testimony of this person. When we it, but in some of them, in the later editions, it said that uh, that uh, he's not Naaman, meaning there was a typo, you know, because back then they didn't have a print, so they, ha they have a, a Talmud, and they'd copy it by hand from one uh, to make a copy for another, and sometimes there'd be a typo. Uh, maybe they'd uh, write uh, Eino Ne'eman instead of Ne'eman, right? They, they write, he is not, uh, he is uh, not, a, maybe he's looking at a different line accidentally when he writes. Th these, these things happen a lot when you're copying manuscripts by hand. And so the Hachanim, they really had to investigate to try to figure out what is the correct uh what is the correct edition? What is the correct formulation? It says, It says, and because of this mistake, right, that was copied into some of uh, the books of the Talmud, who were then further copied into other books of the Talmud, right? 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 So some of the Geonim were following this mistaken edition of the Talmud, uh, they said that we do not accept this kind of person's testimony. The Gamzu Taud Gedolai says, and this is a big mistake. Right? It says, and this is because of a typo. 
a mistaken edition. ומצאתי בגבילים כתוב, אזל בראה ביני לבין דילה, right? He says, and I found in the original editions of the Talmud, the older ones, that we do accept the testimony, אף על פי שהספרים המוגהים, כמו שאמרנו, כך יראה מדין התלמוד. He says, and therefore, since I was able to locate, right, and identify uh, the right edition of the Talmud, the right formulation of the Halakha, says, this is how uh, the, uh, this is how the Halakha should be according to the Talmud. This is Dina Talmud. This is the law of the Talmud. So there's a few things that contribute to what uh, the law of the Talmud consists. It's one is, it has to make sense. Your explanation of the sugya has to make sense according to uh, the flow of the Talmud. Um, two is you have to have a proper tradition of how to understand the, the Talmud. Uh, a third thing is you have to make sure you have the right edition of the Talmud. Uh, by the way, uh, the printed editions today are all censored, not just have typos, but they also have a lot of censorship. Um, th th that's already a known fact. So, so we already know how to correct for a lot of the censorship. Uh, but now, by the, one of the great things of of our present generation is we have access to much older editions of the Talmud, of writings of the Gionim, things that have been lost for many, many years throughout our 2000 year uh, uh, exile because we have recovered this same uh, Kahirian uh, archive. And we're able to, uh, to restore a lot of the old writings, both of the Talmud and of many of the other writings that developed throughout the years from this Kahirian Geniza. And this is something that uh, Maimonides was very unique with, is he had access also to these old original uh, um, copies of the Talmud, uh, besides having the tradition of how to understand the Talmud, and besides also having one of the greatest minds throughout our 2000 year exile and learning from some of the greatest minds, such as Rabbi Yosef HaLevi bin Megas and inheriting the tradition of the Bis Hakel Fasim. And he put a book together summarizing all of the decisions of the Talmud. He says, in our times now, right? we are uh, subject to even more persecution than before. As I'm going to remind you that the Rambam himself, um, he had to flee Spain. He had to flee um, uh, North Africa, Morocco. He had to flee Eretz Israel until he finally settled in uh, Egypt. So he says, you know, Everywhere, everywhere throughout the, the Jewish world, you know, there's persecution, right? And everybody is, is distressed. And as always, every previous generation before, whenever there's persecution, right, uh, wisdom diminishes as well. Right? And it's, and even the hachamim that we've had, it's now more difficult to understand other teachings. So while the Rambam had access to the wisdom of Rabbi uh, Yosef Levi bin Megas, right? Most other people have a hard time understanding uh, Rabbi Yosef Levi bin Megas's uh, uh, teachings. Lefichach otan apirushim v'teshuvot v'alachot shechidberu hagionim v'ra'u shehem devarim mevoarim. He says, therefore, all of the writings of the Hachamim, of the Geonim, right? Whether it's their books on Halakha, whether, whether it's their commentaries on the Talmud. Uh, back then, when they wrote it, it was, 
it was understood to everybody. Everybody understood well uh, their answers. Today, people are having a, a hard time understanding them. And only very, very few of the Tal Hachamim of our generation, or talking about his generation, are able to really comprehend and understand uh, the writings of the Gionim. Right? And it says, and, and that's not even talking about the Talmud itself, which is much, much more difficult to understand. Bavli, the Yerushalmi, both the Babylonian Talmud and the Yerushalmi, the Palestinian or Jerusalem Talmud, the Sifra, the Sifre, the Hatosefto, right, and all of this Tanaic and, uh, and Amoraic literature that came afterwards is very, very difficult to understand. Shehen Serichin, Dat, Rehava, the Nefesh, Hachama, Uzman, Aroch. That in order to understand it, you need to have very broad understanding. You have to have very deep understanding of all of this literature and a lot of time to dedicate to studying. And only then, and only then can someone know uh, just you know how to behave. What is mutar? What is a sur? Right? What is kasher and what is tameh? Uh, only after all of this effort in trying to understand, being super wise and dedicating so much time. Can the simple person finally know, is this mutar or not? That's that, that's all the person wants wants to know. So therefore, and this is why I was awakened to this task, right? I Moshe Beribi Maimon, right? The Rambam Asifaradi from Spain, from the center of Torah in Spain in Cordova. Right, and I depended on God Himself to guide me. And I studied all of these books, right, and all of this literature, and I found it proper. Right? And I found it uh, necessary to put together a book that just tells the people what is Asur and what is Mutar, what is Kasher and what is not, what is Tameh and what is Tahor, of all of the laws of the Torah. He's going one step further than Rabbi Ishaq al-Fasi. Rabbi Ishaq al-Fasi, he just copied down, he copied down the the conclusions of the Talmud, using the same language of the Talmud. And he only uh, bothered with whatever was relevant during the times uh, of the exile. The Rambam says, I'm going to do this for all of the Torah. Even things that have to do with the Korbanot, even things that have to do with the Beit HaMikdash, things that may not be relevant to uh, us living in Egypt or in Morocco or in Poland or wherever we are during the times of uh, uh, during the times of uh, of the exile. However, I want to have one book that is clear to everybody in a simple language that summarizes all of the halachot that anybody may need to know any period of time throughout Jewish history, whether we have a temple or not. All of them are going to be brief, right, and clear. Until the entire oral law can be accessible to everybody. And everybody could also learn it off by heart. Right? <coughs> without bringing in all of the deliberations between the hachamim, This one challenges with this, and he answers him with that. He says, I'm excluding all of that. Right? And not one saying one, and another person bringing another argument and another argument. No, 
I'm just going to bring what the conclusions are, right? In a simple language, uh, in, in a well-edited, structured book. Right? I want it to be clear. And it's going to be based on all of the literature that has been published from the times of the Biuda Hanasin, the publication of the Mishnah, until today, including all of the explanations and commentaries of the Geronim. Ad shiyu kol hadinin giluim, the katan velagadol, bedin kol misva misva. Right, until it becomes clear to everybody, whether they be young or beginner or old and wise, right, on any one of the 613 misvot. We have 613 misvot, all of them have halachot. I want everybody to have equal access to all of the halachot of the oral law. Right? And then also all of the takanot, that uh, any court from the times of the prophets until our times, any anything they instituted themselves will also be included. This is the general rule. Right, so nobody should want or need any other book in order to know the halakha, any halakha uh, of any of the laws of the Jewish people. But this book will include all of the oral Torah. Imatakanot, right, with all of the uh, enactments of the later courts, Vamin Hagot, and all of the customs, Vehagizerot, and anything uh, that the Hachamim forbade, Shina Asumi Motu Moshe Rabbeinu, Ve'ad Hibura Talmud, right, anything that was instituted by the national courts from the times of Moses until the sealing of the Talmud which has the status of the last nationally binding uh, uh, legal publication. In the ways that the Geonim have explained the Sugiyot to us, right, in all of the writings that they published after the publication of the Talmud. Therefore, I call this book that I'm putting together the Mishneh Torah. Mishneh Torah means uh, secondary to the Torah. Why secondary to the Torah? If Yishe Adam kore Torah shi b'ikhtav t'chidla v'achar kach kore b'ze. Right? Because the person only needs to do now is read scripture, the Torah shi b'ikhtav, read the Bible, read the five books of Moses, and then he could read in these books of Moses Maimonides. And he can know from this book all of the oral law. So everyone has access to the written law. And now everyone's going to have equal access to the oral law as well. And he doesn't need... To, to read any other book other than these two in order to know all of the laws that uh, God gave us. It says, right? And I divided this book into, well, it has different volumes, it has 14 volumes, and each one is divided into different volumes. Right? Right? how to construct the temple, right? So each one has its own designated <coughs> designated halachot. halachot lifrakim, and all of those will be divided into chapters. Shebeoto inyan, right? All of your chot Shabbat is like well, about 30 chapters, right? So it'll be divided into 30 chapters. There's one chapter talking about Bishun on Shabbat. There's one chapter talking about Pikuach Nefesh, 
on Shabbat. There's another chapter talking about uh, uh, any of the different melachot of, of Shabbat, right? And each one of these chapters, they'll be divided into uh, specific formulations called the halakha, right? Halakha is be like a paragraph, a few sentences, but maybe one law may consist of a few laws in it, but it'll be something that's easy, easy to, to read and to, to remember and to memorize. Right? This way it could be memorized, each of these halakhot. Remember, in the end, although this is written uh, in, uh, in, in a well-structured book, this is still the oral law and should be as much as possible memorized off by heart. It says, right? I am Moses, the son of Maimon, uh, uh, the great judge. Rabbi Yosef was the son of Rabbi Yosef HaChacham, Rabbi Yitzhak HaDayan, right? The son of Rabbi Yosef was the son of Rabbi Yitzhak, was the son of another Rabbi Yosef HaDayan, Bar Ovadia HaDayan. So he comes from a long lineage of, uh, of courts, of uh, judges in the court of Cordoba, Rabbi Shalomo Harab, Rabbi Ovadia HaDayan. And he goes back here, let's see, that's one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven generations of Dayani, seven generations of uh, of uh, judges in the court of Cordoba, which is the capital of the Jewish people, right? Ever since the arrival of Rabbi uh, Hanoch, Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Hanoch. Right, one of those four captives, and one of these would have been present during that time when Rabbi Moshe Rabbi Hanoch came to Cordoba and became the new head of the community, and uh, and the others, the later ones, would have been his students. Right, so he's establishing here uh, not only his access to the Hachamim and his access to uh, the original versions of the Talmud, but also his tradition that he received from these authoritative characters, uh, from this most authoritative at the time, uh, court in, Sp in Spain, the new capital of the Jewish people at his time. Um, uh, this, by the way, is why I personally, when I study halakha, I, I go to the source. Uh, if I'm studying halakha with my boys, instead of opening the Talmud, which is very tedious in order to understand what everyone just, I just go to the source, I go to Maimonides, see, and it really is uh, the most simplest formulation of halakha. It really is structured well and intelligently and logically and and, and written uh, simply. Um, so that's the end. After here, after the publication of the Mishneh Torah, right? It's uh, so, so some some rabbis they find it very ironic. It's 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 very funny that uh, Maimonides says that the purpose of this book is that a person can read. Uh, can read uh, the written law and then my book, and he won't need any other book. And there has been no other, uh, there's been no other scholar who has had more books written about him than Maimonides himself. So on the one hand, he says, no, you're not gonna need any other books after this. On the other hand, there's maybe 700 books that were written about that. And anybody who, from the times of Maimonides until today, who, who writes about halakha, it was either structured on Maimonides, it was uh, kind of as like a, uh, what's it called, like an ispah at the end, like an appendix to Maimonides, an explanation to Maimonides, uh, to the point where the Shuhan Aruch says, I'm taking three hachamim, and I'm going to be basing my uh, uh, my halachic decisions on Maimonides and the Bishak al-Fasi, who was his teacher, and as we said before, 
Maimonides himself says, maybe I have 10 challenges or 10 things that I don't agree with Rabbi Yishak al right? And uh, the Rosh, uh, Rabbeinu Asher, was also from Spain, much, much later on. Uh, uh, um, and so, essentially, all, all halakha that we have today are pretty much the climax of the development of the Torah Shebe'al Peh uh, was with the publication of Maimonides' book on Halakha, the Mishneh Torah. And the next stage in the evolution of the Torah Shebe'al Peh would be the reestablishment and reinstitution of the Supreme Court uh, whenever the Chachamim decide to get around to doing that. Um, any, any questions so far? So we'll just go briefly uh, through the generations, right? So it all started with the Exodus, right? The Siat in the year 2448. Over a period of 40 years, we received the Torah Shabbat al uh, During that time, they instituted the Supreme Court of Israel that consists of 71 judges. And from generation to generation, the supreme authority, legal authority over the Jewish people was this Supreme Court. And this carried on all the way until uh, the destruction of the Second Temple. And then after the destruction of the Second Temple, there was no more real Supreme Court. And the Hafamim, what they did was, uh, even before then, they started putting together all sorts of traditions, which eventually uh, uh, cultivated into the Mishnah, right? The Mishnah, of Rabbi Yudah Hanasi was the first time the oral law was actually uh, 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 publicly accessible, pu published to the people in written form. Up until then, a different hachamim, they took notes, uh, but whatever they would teach, they would teach uh, off by heart. Uh, they would teach it in their own words. And different hachamim, they would write their own notes based on these lectures until the times of the Buddha Hanasi, who put it all together. Um, I'm, you know, this is very, very, uh, I'm going through this very quick. There's some skipping a few steps on, on the way, right? And then uh, after the publication of the Mishnah, uh, the conditions in the land of Israel became very, very uh, difficult. And the new capital of the Jewish people now moved to Babylon. And during this time in Babylon, there's uh, already instituted these two big yeshivot, right? After the publication of the Mishnah, the two, two of the main students of Rabbi Yudha Hanasi uh, moved to Babylon, and they each became a heads of these yeshivot, the Sura and Bumbedita, right? Zrav and Shemuel. Those are his two main students. And uh, they have this institute going on over there of the Kala, which twice a year, everyone comes and assembles at the yeshivot, and they discuss one tract of the Mishnah. And this has been going on for many, many years. And then we get to uh, the end of the Amoraic period, where we have Ravina and Rav Asher, the heads of the yeshivot in Bavel. Uh, uh, Ravin, uh, Rav Asher, he presides there in the yeshiva for a period of about 60 years. And during this period of 60 years, uh, during the Kala uh, sessions, they finish, they complete the entire Mishnah twice. And they record these discussions. And he started this project of recording the discussions on the Mishnah and putting them into writing, right? Uh, until uh, he passed away. And then he was, this project was continued by his son and this compilation that he put together is what we call the Babylonian Talmud. And this Babylonian Talmud is basically the last Supreme Court of Israel, uh, effectively. All right. After that time, uh, more persecution, more problems for the Jews. People can't uh, uh, can't come. Uh, in their masses to Bavel and participate in the Kala. 
and therefore the Kala Institute no longer represents, uh, no longer represents the opinions of all of the Hakamim. And if it's not representative of everybody, then it can't be legally binding on everybody. So it's nice minhag of the Kala continues on. Uh, however, not in the same. Uh, 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 it's it's not it's not as large and it's not as effective. Um, so the Talmud is published. This is considered to be the last uh, authoritative publication of the Jewish people. Now everything is dependent on what's written in the Talmud from that day on. And so we have a few generations later on uh, called the Geonim and the Savuraim, right? Who are the heads of the Yeshivot in Bavel? after the publication of the Talmud. And so these Geonim, they all have the best tradition because they come from those yeshivot of the publication of the Talmud, of how to understand the Talmud. And some of them are very wise. Some of them are wise, but not as wise as others, right? So uh, they are the more most authoritative figures up until now to tell us the, uh, the proper understanding of the discussions in the Talmud. Um, however, their decisions aren't 100% binding, right? If what they say doesn't necessarily fit perfectly with the Talmud, and you can suggest a different understanding of the Talmud, uh, and you can prove it, then by all means, you follow your understanding and not the Gaon's understanding. And during this time, many questions are directed towards the Gaonim, and they write their answers and publish them. They publish them publicly, and they send them back. And some of the Gionim also write books on halakha. Some of them write sidurim. And, and however, over, over the course of these generations, uh, uh, conditions become worse and worse for the Jewish people in Bavel. As it's becoming worse and worse for the people in Bavel, it's becoming better for the Jews of Spain. And Spain starts to rise as a, as a big center of the Jewish people. Bavel is lo losing its political influence over the Jewish people. And Spain is gaining political influence over the Jewish people. Uh, Bavel is losing its, its uh, legal uh, authority over the Jewish people. And Spain is gaining this legal authority until, until uh, this event of the four captives happens where Four hachamim from Bavel, right, are captured by pirates at sea and sold around the Mediterranean, and they become the new generation of Babylonian, uh, uh, Babylonian hachamim in Spain, and and they turn, they actually turn that that uh, court of Spain in Cordoba. Uh, to the new capital of the Jewish people, all right? And uh, so that started with Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Hanok, and then later on with Rabbi Hananel, who was actually in Tunis, and his student was Rabbi Ishaq Fasi in Tunis, who relocated to Cordoba, Spain, right? And now, uh, this from now on, it's 100% Cordoba, Spain, the new capital of the Jewish people. His student is Rabbi Yosef Hadevi ibn Megas, Right, and his student is Rabbi Moshe, and Rabbi Maimon Hadayan, the father of Maimonides, whose student was Maimonides. Rabbi Ishaq al Farsi, right, he also wrote books on halacha that were uh, uh, inclusive of all of the interpretations of the previous, as well as Rabbi Yosef Hanavi ibn Megas, and Maimonides collected all of this. In addition to all of this, he also had access to original copies of the Talmud, and he put together a book written in plain Hebrew, uh, well-structured, uh, that brings all the conclusions of the Talmud with all of the interpretations of the Geonim, and uh, puts it together in a 14-volume uh, book that covers all of the oral law, all of Torah Shabbat and even after Maimonides, who was referred to not only as, he wasn't just called the legal, the top legal authority of the Jewish people, 
but he was also referred to as Ra'is al Yahud, right? The head of the Jews. He was also the political leader of the Jewish people because he was extremely wise and he was, and, and, and we see his influence uh, extending all the way down to Yemen and all throughout the Jewish uh, world, uh, not just legally, but uh, the people looked up to him as, as the leader of the Jewish people. Uh, and we see his future generations are also referred to as Nagid, uh, which is the equivalent of being the Rosh Galut. So uh, he actually had both uh, the legal and the political leadership was, uh, was both concentrated in him and also his sons and his future generations uh, we see uh, for a while afterwards. And, and I would just like to quickly go through uh, the introduction, where is it? Said, if anyone remembers our first class, he said there's six general rules that you need to understand regarding the oral law. The one is, kol tokef Torah, the validity of the Torah from the covenant at Horev, at Har Sinai, has its validity from one thing, it's national consensus, right? Why does the Torah obligate us? If It's not because God created us, because we never asked him to, but it's because we freely contracted an agreement with God, right, as a nation. And that's why we accepted the Torah upon ourselves. So anything that's legally binding, needs to be one representative of the entire nation, because that's how we accepted the Torah, and it needs to be accepted by the entire nations, by the entire nation. Right? The Chachamim that received their semicha from this national court that was established then, right, uh, and then later appointed other Chachamim, and later appointed other Chachamim, right, they were appointed also by the consensus of the entire nation. Moshe Rabbeinu was the first. Remember, Moshe Rabbeinu, why, is, why do we recognize his authority? It's not because God chose him. God chose Moses to represent God to us. But we chose Moses to represent our side of this deal to God. Moses has authority over us because we appointed him, freely appointed him to represent us to God, right? And he appointed a court, and this accord appoints other hachamim, right? Who appoints other hachamim uh, from generation to generation, all right? Kol Moshe right? Anything that we received from Moshe. There is no dispute among the hachamim about it. All the disputes are due to uh, later uh, 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 later cases that came to court that weren't specific or weren't specified by Moses because over 40 years, how, how specific can you get? While over the course of thousands of years, there's a million, millions of new cases that come to court that need to be uh, decided. Right, so that's where different disputes come between the hachamim. But even then, they have certain set of tools that are agreed upon in advance. Right, the yudim and midot, the thirteen, uh, the thirteen uh, uh, rules that they have. Is, uh, we do klal uprat, right? Gezer uh, shava. If you remember, if, if you remember these terms, uh, since the time of Horev, right, the uh, the covenant that we put in Horev. Which was accepted right by the entire nation. He said, the Torah is not in the heavens. We already accepted the terms of the covenant with God. Nobody has the right to change the terms, not even God Himself. So any prophet that comes to us or anybody claiming to be a prophet that comes to us and says, I have a new rule or 
uh, one of the rules changed or one of the 613 misvot is no longer valid, we know that he is a false prophet because nobody has the right to change the term of this covenant that we made with God. Once the Talmud has been published and sealed, and since the publication of the Talmud, there is no longer any institute that uh, properly represents the entire nation's decisions or opinions, the Talmud is in effect the last national court of Israel that received a public consensus of the entire nation. And, so the, and it also spread out throughout the entire nation. Therefore, um, the rulings of the Talmud are binding on everybody. And nothing post-Talmud is binding on anybody or, 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 or binding on everybody unless it's based on the Talmudic decision. Is that understood? And that brings me to the last, the sixth uh, rule, uh, which I didn't mention in the first uh, class. Uh, but since the, the Talmud's decisions are what's binding, right? It doesn't matter who said what, as long as it can be properly founded in the Talmud. And the tradition of understanding the Talmud passed through the Geonim of Bavir and eventually to the Yeshiva in Cordoba, Spain. And in effect, it ended with the publication of the Mishneh Torah by Maimonides which spread out throughout the entire nation. This is my personal opinion. My opinion is that we should accept the Mishneh Torah of the Maimonides as the baseline for all of Halakha. Whenever we study Halakha, the source that we should be going to should be the Mishneh Torah because it reflects better than any other publication the decisions of the Talmud, both because Maimonides uh, comes from this yeshiva of Cordoba. Uh, we studied under the tutelage of the Bis Hakal Fasi and the Yosef Alevi Ibn Megas, and they put together all of the commentaries of the Geonim, and he also had access to all of the proper and original uh, original uh, manuscripts of the Talmud. So, in my opinion, his book, the Mishneh Torah, best reflects, better than anything else, the actual decisions of the Talmud. Um, and uh, that's basically been the, the, the status of the Torah Shabbat from Maimonides about 850 years ago until today. Not much has changed. The next stage, which we are waiting for, in the development of the Torah Shabbat Peh, Hashem, is when the Hachamim gather and establish a new Supreme Court, a new Halachic Supreme Court of Israel, uh, uh, which should uh, hopefully happen sometime in the near future. Uh, that would be the pinnacle of our redemption, the new Supreme Court of uh, uh, new Jewish. Supreme Court and the construction of a temple. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, insights? Uh, maybe I can ask. Um, I hear. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear there, you. there is a rabbi, Rav. Uh, Yossi Mizrahi, he of, often explains how um, after you die, uh, you will be presented uh, in a court with a film, what you were, what you did. Uh, and it oh. will be like uh, speaking in front of a court. Is this uh, like a court that he is referring to, or is it is to be referred to? No, no, this is something else. This is something else. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm talking it, about it... an actual 
uh, court, like Supreme Court that every nation should have, that we should have one as well, uh, that goes according to the terms of this uh, of this covenant. What he's talking about is is, is like a divine court. It's mm -hmm. not, there's no people presiding the court. It's God and maybe with some angels that are judging your life to see do you deserve to be in Gan Eden or to be in Gehenom. Hopefully, okay. we'll address uh, that topic much more in depth in our next course. Not the next um, class. It'll be a more advanced class in the next course. Okay, thank you. It's a um, high level. I don't know if we are up to... I'm going to try uh, to follow the footsteps of Maimonides and try to simplify uh, as much as possible. Okay, the idea is there. It's already a big thing. Thank you very much. Sure. Anything else on uh, the topic of the oral law? Okay, I see. I, I have a question. Understands the oral? Yes, is this Michaela? Yeah, it's Michaela. Um, so you mentioned the Supreme Court, and Israel has a Supreme Court today. And I was just wondering, how would this Supreme Court? How do you see the transference from the from the Supreme Court today, the Supreme Court that is more in line with Torah? That's that's an excellent question. That's that's an excellent question. Um, question is: Do do we need to appoint an uh, like a civil supreme court and a religious supreme court? Because in truth, according to Jewish tradition, originally there is no there is no differentiation between a civil supreme court, uh, which which is what you're talking about, what we have today, and the religious supreme court. Because uh, really, there there's just one Supreme Court. Because Judaism isn't a religion; Judaism is a nationality, and as any nationality, we have uh, we have a land that we call home, and in that land we have a military, and we have our national institutions, which could be the military, the political establishment, and the uh, legal establishment, uh, and this is what our Jewish National Supreme Court is. How do we make that step from our current civil Supreme Court, which is not too friendly to uh, to Jewish law, to a National Jewish Supreme Court, which is governed by Jewish law? Uh, don't know. Don't know how it's, how it's going to happen. It's very interesting. In my opinion, I think over time, eventually, the civil Supreme Court will be more and more reflective of, uh, of Jewish law. And that's really what I hope. And we won't need to establish a separate Supreme Court. Uh, remember, in order for a Jewish Supreme Court to have any validity, it needs to be accepted by the entire Jewish nation. So really what needs to happen first is that there'll be some sort of awakening, however that may happen, among the Jewish nation that they demand this type of Supreme Court, which today, unfortunately, there is no real demand for that by the entirety of the Jewish people. Mm. So, so that would also, that would also null and void the part where so, for instance, from what I've understood from the protests that have been going on, the left Sorry? side concern. So, what I've understood today, the protests, for instance, that's been going on in Israel, that Sorry, would. You. Did you say that again? But I may have a bad connection. Um. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Yeah. Good. So. So. Um. That would. Um. For instance, that would null and void any. Um, force being put on the Jewish people in regards to um, acting more in line with Torah. So the, they will, it would come Any from the force? people. It would it would come from the people. 
But it has to be it has to be appointed by the people. Of course, the Supreme yeah. Court has its authorities, and it has punitive authorities. It can execute people as well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, just uh, uh, okay. It's it's nice we have a Supreme Court. They make uh, decisions. I'm not happy with this decision, the specific decision that they made. So therefore, uh, I'm free to do as I like. Once there's a national Supreme Court that's governed by Jewish law, right, we accept it same way today. The, the civil Supreme Court is accepted by the nation, right? And they have uh, all sorts of authorities that may uh, conflict with a specific per person's uh, beliefs and rights. A court can, uh, can sentence someone to a lifetime in jail. I'm sure he's not going to be happy about that. Uh, but he can't say, I, I reject uh, the Supreme Court's authority. The Supreme Court, as an institute, derives its authority from the consensus of uh, the entire nation, uh, but not of any specific person. And they have the authority to punish people uh, for crimes that they make. Of course, these punishments are also founded in Jewish law. They're not just out of the book. No. no. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any any other questions? All right. So this topic of the oral law. Is understood. Excellent. Okay. So that's our first introductory course. Um, introduction to the oral law. And I'm hoping that our next course will also be an introductory course, an introduction to uh to, to Jewish philosophy and thought, or at least Maimonidean philosophy and thought. If that sounds uh that sounds good to all of you. Thank you.